Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is a webinar put on behalf of the Community Practice of the Ontologies um, of the CGIR. Beyond the webinar, there's a lot of different ways to be connected and involved. Um, there's a website that comes in through the CGR Big Data Platform, but it's an Ontologies section. Um, so there's information being posted there. We have a more interactive platform on the LinkedIn, and this is really we're trying to um, encourage everyone to share and exchange information here. Um, next, we have a YouTube channel that's dedicated to our webinar series. And then finally, we have a newsletter. I'm going to just hand it over to Elizabeth, who heads uh, the community practice of ontologies. So I just want to thank again our three speakers for accepting sharing their expertise and knowledge with our community of practice. This community was created uh, three years ago and uh, is keeping growing. Uh, because we have more than uh, 200 members uh, subscribed to the newsletter. We have an active LinkedIn group with na um, 90 members. So I think the topic about ontologies, application in agriculture is quite uh, popular. And then this uh, series was created this year, and this is the last of the series for 2019, but we will resume next year, of course. And we, today we focus on Knowledge Graph because uh, we had some um, web, a webinar on machine learning and Knowledge Graph was uh, mentioned there. So we had some feedback from attendees that they would like to have a, a webinar focusing on Knowledge Graph uh, so they could understand uh, this uh, technology and how it is used and what could be the potential for data in agriculture. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. So we have three panelists today, as mentioned, and let's get started uh, with starting us out on the introduction of Knowledge Graphs with Kurt Kegel. He's the founder and CEO of Semantical LLC. All right, good morning from where I am. My name is Kurt Kegel. I have been involved in working with semantics and the field of graphs and graph technologies for approximately the last 15 to 20 years. Um, uh, it's a field that has been growing fairly significantly, particularly just in the last five. Uh, it started out with work that was done around the 2000-2001 time period where the inventor of the web, Tim Berners-Lee, decided to go back to one of the fundamental problems that he had actually started with back before he had put together the first web browser and server in uh, the early 1990s. When he had begun that effort, it hadn't really been to launch an entirely new platform, and that was almost accidental. His real mission at the time was essentially to provide a way of generating citational information for the physicists and engineers that worked at the uh, CERN laboratory in Switzerland. Um, and along the way, one of the things that he kept coming back to was essentially this, this question of how do you represent information? How do you represent knowledge, especially knowledge of information that comes from multiple different sources and from multiple different um, um, forms? And in the process, um, you know, was managed to actually come up with ideas that were taken in part from a lot of um, primary logic systems that had been developed in the 1980s and in through the early 1990s that were going back almost to, to the 1960s and, and the first representations of documents. Um, but one of the things that he realized was that if you can basically represent information by saying, using the same constructs that we talk about in a typical language class, you know, your your sentence diagrams of sentence of, of subject, predicate, object, adverb, so forth. Um, you can effectively represent information in a way that is fundamentally different from how it had been up to that point, because up until then, uh, most of the information that was dealt with essentially used the idea that came out of the work of Ted Codd in the 1970s, um, 
where he was basically looking at the question of how do I store information in a form that allows me to get at a granular level. And Ted Codd's innovation was basically the, the notion of tables and rows and columns and the use of these to be able to get the information that you're looking at down to an absolute minimum. What changed, and one of the things that um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee came to was the idea that you could actually take these rows and columns and you could break them down even farther down to essentially um, fundamental vectors of information. Um, um, or as I was describing to a colleague today, tensors of information that allow you to effectively create graphs of information um, where you have information, where you have essentially representations of subjects, representations of entities, and the properties that connect one entity to another. Um, this pattern of, of subject predicate object or subject predicate attribute was one that he realized was pretty much universal and by it you could essentially take that same kind of information and use it to break down the whole notion of information spaces into um, these assertions or what he called triples to be able to create these graphs of information where the triples basically connected one to the other. So this notion of basically saying I can take information where you start with a an entity of a certain type, a relationship, and a target. Um, that notion where you could basically do this breakdown was essentially one that eventually became what was known as the semantic web. In other words, what he could do was to basically say, if I have certain information, I can break that down into these uh, assertions, store the assertions, index them, and from those indexes, then basically walk through and develop um, descriptions of documents that basically identify information. So this process where you basically take that information and you break it down to its, its almost atomic core was something that he had begun working in around 2000. And by 2004, he had actually produced a, a, an article for Scientific American called The Semantic Web, which looked at its viability as a language that you could basically specify detailed information. So I'm going to kind of skip around, um, you know, pretty quickly to to basically point out the idea of saying if I can create an entity, I can basically break that entity down. The once he had introduced this by 2000 and seven, this had basically blossomed into uh, talking about information in, um, you know, using fairly well-defined uh, logical predicates and logical structures that in turn would end up becoming what would, be, what would become known as RDF, the Resource Description Framework. And that resource description framework essentially then, again, broke everything down to its component parts. So I could basically talk about an entity, um, whether that entity be, uh, say, information about a publisher, uh, a magazine. You know, I can I can basically take that same concept and break it down into here's a magazine of information. Um, that information, in turn, could then be used to navigate across an information space. So in this case, I'm basically saying here is a, um, an, a magazine about graph or graph information. That magazine information, in turn, is tied into uh, the specific articles. And the articles themselves 
have a number of properties that are associated with them, including such properties as, say, a description of the content that you're dealing with, or an image, or relationships to other things, you know, an, edi an editorial type, an author, the classification of that particular entity. And because of the way that this is set up, because you can essentially build this in a largely context-free system, it also means that the information that you're dealing with can be set up to be used without, before knowing what it was, to be able to take this information and um, uh, present it in, a, in essentially a context-free system. So if I go in, for example, with an article, I have a number of properties that are associated with that article. And again, these basically are just these atomic vectors or links that say, here is a relationship between this thing, in this case, an article, the type, the author, the class, and other properties related to those. And each of these in turn can be navigated step by step to be able to allow you to see different views and perspectives. So here, for instance, is the view that you have in the articles of all of the available editorial articles that happen to be on a particular site. You can use the same thing to essentially um, pull in information and tie it into a topical structure. So I can also basically step, you know, one step back and say, okay, for all of the articles that are in a certain area, um, I can bind that to its topical representation. And of course, none of that's where I wanted it to be anyway. This idea works very well when you're talking about um, things like publishing and stuff like that, but you can also use the same concepts to talk fundamentally about any other kind of information. For instance, I can basically go in and say, I'd like to talk about nucleic acids. Um, I added these particular pieces last night to show the relationships that you had here. In this case, here is a listing of nucleic acids. This listing basically comes from a simple, uh, essentially context-free query about the information that, or about the information against the database. And it was something that was essentially edited or added directly through the interface that I'm working with with my application here. Once I have that, I can then say, okay, I, I have this relationship, you know, the sum of nucleic acids I can go to, let's go to adenine, for instance. And adenine, in turn, also has certain information that is available, including the fact that it's found in certain macromolecules, the fact that it has a complementary nucleic acid, um, it has no substitute nucleic acids. I can even get into properties and do things like saying, okay, I have a chemical formula that's basically tied into how we work with adenine. Um, I can look at its complement, which is uh, the complement pair in the DNA system, and I have the information that ties this all together. I can even go in and say, once I have that, I can represent this as a graph of information that describes the various entities that are currently defined in the system. So for thymine, I have an information that says it's a substitute nucleic acid. So when you when you go from DNA to RNA, it'll basically say that I'm swapping out thymine for uracil. From this, I can also see um, the complementary nucleic acid, which is adenine. And I can also see, okay, adenine is something that's tied into something like lysine, which is um, a, an amino acid. Um, that amino acid basically then says I have colon or codon positions for that information, creating additional graphs that allow me to say, okay, I've got position one, position two, and somewhere in here should be position three, but I'm not sure I'm showing it. Again, as I'm navigating through the system, I can then go back and say, okay, let's take a look at this codon. And the codon in turn basically codes for 
information where I show adenine, adenine, and guanine as the three codon representations for this particular entity. This also builds into the amino acid called lysine. Um, from lysine, I then basically also have information that says, oh, okay, this particular information or this particular uh, uh, amino acid has is a product of these particular um, um, codon sequences. So the same idea of basically working with the information from this graph allows you to go in <coughs> and uh, build out these connections, build out the, um, the, the relevant um, uh, data that you want to be able to build from. And it's essentially something that can build in such a way that you are largely independent of um, the topic at hand but you can essentially then use these to navigate through an information space to be able to get to the relevant information that you're looking for to be able to search on this information. So if I go in here and I say Seattle, I can basically use that to search this content to be able to find content that's related and then use it as well to go and navigate through the information system that we have to be able to get properties such as what state this is in, what country this is in, and how those work together. This is basically, um, we're moving into a modality now where this kind of capability is becoming more and more common. A lot of the base systems for being able to support this, the triple stores that are currently available, have really kind of changed pretty significantly just in the last three to four years. As the technology has become more sophisticated, as we've begun using uh, things like GPUs, uh, and their ability to work with vectors at a, a core processing level to be able to do rapid searches and the ability then to also work with essentially cloud-based systems. All of these basically tie together to develop a framework where this way of storing information, of accessing information in a neutral manner, in a way that essentially allows you to expand out the concept into different ontologies. Um, is essentially becoming relatively commonplace. And I think you're going to see it more and more as uh, businesses in particular began recognizing this for such things as uh, research for supply chain management, for enterprise data management, um, and other things along those lines. Um, because you can essentially abstract out the properties that you're dealing with and the classes that you're dealing with, it means that you can also essentially integrate these into different systems. I'm actually very um, bullish on where I think this technology is going. I think the graph technology in general is going to be kind of the highlight of, of you know, the, the where databases in general are going over the course of the next five years. And I expect you'll be seeing a lot more of it over that period. And I believe my time is just about up. So I'll give the floor back to uh, my lovely co-host here. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was really interesting. Um, we're going to go right into our next panelist, who is Michael, and he's going to talk about ontologies, text mining, and knowledge graphs in scientific research and development. Over to you, Michael. Okay, thank you, and um, hello. Thanks for, for listening, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, knowledge graphs, but with a very kind of application focus. Um, to, to support um, scientists working in research and development to help them um, kind of answer the qu kind of questions they want to answer or to help support them build hypotheses. I come from a company called Cybite uh, based in Cambridge in the UK. We specialize in um, taking ontologies um, primarily from the public domain and then we work those up so that they are more um, applicable for use in um, text mining. So many of our customers who want to build um, knowledge graphs, they want to be able to take data from kind of structured databases in the public domain, maybe their own internal content. Um, and, but a big thing 
um, to, to get to populate these knowledge graphs is to pull information from unstructured text. So that's using resources such as um, PubMed or um, clinical trials or um, other internal text documents and extract out um, those important nuggets of information that can all be kind of brought together um, in the knowledge graph space. So as I mentioned, um, we specialize in, in building ontologies with, with a focus on text annotation. Um, this, um, this wheel that we can see here, it lays out a number of the, um, the, the key ontologies that we have, um, that we have as our company. Um, so there's um, the, typically the, the most heavily used ones are things in the kind of indications, genes, um, anatomical features, cell types, biological process. So for example, we'll start with, for gene names, we'll start with um, an ontology in the public domain, such as the, the Human Genome Naming Convention. We'll make it um, text mining friendly, which I'll explain a bit further um, in the next bit. And um, then we use that for annotating text. Um, you'll see on this wheel there's an agro section. So we also have ontologies around this, things like the plant trait ontology, and the plant ontology, micronutrients, food, and, and so, some others as well. So the next image there is where we have um, is to illustrate the, the issues with, with synonymy. Whenever you want to do one of these text annotations using ontology, what we find is that those ontologies in the public domain, they've not been um, enriched with all of the kind of synonyms that people use to describe something in unstructured text. So we have this example of Alpers disease, and there's a whole bunch of other terms which mean the same thing. And what we want to do when we annotate this in text is to normalize all of that to a single ontology identifier, which would be a mesh ontology, um, ID in our case. And then once you've done that, you can link up to all other, all sorts of other data sources that also use um, um, this kind of mesh um, identifier markup. And the final picture is a, a cute little hedgehog, which is another, to, to illustrate the issues we have um, with text mining, um, and that's ambiguity. So if we just take the word hedgehog and scan a bunch of text for that word, we're gonna find mentions of hedgehog, the, the small um, prickly creature, and also mentions of the gene hedgehog, which is an important signal, in, signaling pathway um, gene. So with these um, ontologies, we have to have rules in there based on the context of where a term appears so that we can get a more accurate um, markup. And this just gives a quick example of what the highlighting looks like in unstructured text. The image on the left is taking a PubMed abstract, and I've labeled it up with various plant trait ontology terms like resistance to pests. Um, we've got species mentions, um, things like the cotton leaf worm and um, Spodoptera literalis. They would normalize to a unique identifier. So um, that's where the ontology comes into play for the text markup. And also the ontology has a hierarchy, so you can start to um, group your, your results at different levels. But this is where it all begins, text annotation. Similarly, we have the image on the right where we've marked up assay titles with cell lines, species, targets, drugs. Um, and it's all about, as I mentioned, taking that content, applying those unique IDs, and then that forms the foundation of then populating um, a knowledge graph. So this is taking us beyond um, uh, finding individual entities on, in text, and now we're trying to pick out relationships. This is where we might want to pick out to populate our knowledge graph. We might want to have drug has target um, gene. And in this case, we've got, for example, the drug Vemurafenib, and it's targeting um, BRAF or BRAF. Um, and we, we know that it's a kind of targeting relationship because it has a, a scientific verb uh, linking the two. Um, we might want to pull out other um, relationships. So we've got the drug and BRAF, but maybe we want treatment relationships. So we've got this drug, Dabrafenib. We can see in the same context, we've got treating metastatic melanoma. Mm. So this is all um, how we can start to build up um, kind of all these lines of evidence by pulling um, relationships from the literature. 
and then we can start to formalize those into those kind of triple structures which we can then use for the knowledge graph population um yeah i have a just a, a simple example here of um how, how we could we often start when we're architecting a knowledge graph and in this case we started with a question in mind that we wanted to build our knowledge graph so that we could help answer that question and in this case it's all about um drug repurposing so maybe a, a company has a particular drug and they have a particular indication that it treats so within the knowledge graph we have these drug treats indication relationships we also know that a drug has a particular target so it's working in a, a certain way but then when it comes to repurposing the, the 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 user might want to know okay so what other indications are there associated with this um, particular drug target that, that my drug could be a, a potential um, use for. So this is where this line with a question mark is that it's just helping support this kind of hypothesis generation of um, finding new indications for an existing therapy. Um, this is a very simplified thing. There's loads, loads of other lines of evidence that you could put into this to help strengthen your hypothesis. But um, hopefully this gives you a good idea of the kind of triples that we had put into a knowledge graph. So what I've done here is just break down the knowledge graph into the um, relationship types that we have in there. And I've shown, tried to show on the right hand side, different sources where we can get that relationship. So maybe we've mined it from PubMed. So we've got drug target relationships, which we've taken from the text. We've annotated with unique ontology IDs. But what that means is we can also go to another source like Kemble, where you've got structured data, which is labeled with ontology IDs and we can start to link up um, that content um, similarly with our drug treats indication relationships we've mined those from drug labels from daily med um, you know, free text pub from PubMed um, clinic clinical trials um, and also Kemble and then we can see targets associated with indication and Again, we've used some sources such as Open Targets, which is a really good one, where again, they've got structured data labeled with ontology IDs, and we can link up to that and, and build it into a knowledge graph system. I'm showing you a quick view of a graph, which is probably too small to see the detail. And um, what we've done is um, build those kinds of relationships that I showed, and we've loaded them into a Neo4j graph database which is a really convenient way to store triples and um, have those labeled up with our ontology identifiers. And within that graph, we've got relations um, such as um, Friedrich. This is about drug repurposing still. So we've got some rare diseases, uh, Friedrich ataxia. We've done some analysis of the text where Friedrich ataxia is mentioned in similar context to Lee disease. So we can say, um, Phenotypically, the two diseases are similar. And what we have is um, we've got drugs that treat Lee disease, but Friedrich ataxia doesn't have the, the coverage. So we're trying to think about um, drug repurposing um, options for Friedrich's ataxia. From another data source, we've got this gene FXN associated with Friedrich ataxia. We've pulled in protein protein interaction data where we've got FXN linked with another gene, BCHA. And then finally, we've got this gene BCHA associated with Lee disease. So now we have two lines of evidence. We've got the phenotypic similarity at the top, mined from the literature. And we've also got some kind of mechanistic connection where Friedrich links to Lee disease via indirect links within the, the knowledge graph. And the great thing is that now that we've got these indirect links, um, even if there's not specific mentions in the literature of this kind of repurposing possibility, we've been able to pull out um, that is a very um, potential uh, indication um, that could be a repurposing candidate. So that's just one example, drug repurposing. Um, we've done a lot of work um, with graphs. Maybe it's people, it could be who's working on what subject, um, who works with who. Um, we've worked within companies who want to see, um, yeah, within their own um, kind of organizations, who's working on what. Um, there's a, an anecdote where it turned out someone's working in the office next door to someone else in, in a company we work with, and they didn't even know they were working on similar stuff. So well, once, you, once you've got a question in mind, you can design your um, knowledge graph, and, and, and it's really very, very open to, to options.
So this is just to um, conclude. So we try to capture domain knowledge um, with as much breadth as we can. So we do that by bringing knowledge from unstructured sources and also data, um, structured sources of data. In order to bring this information together, having a way to link to this data um, by equivalence and using ontologies is um, cr crucial here. In our experience, we generally find building knowledge graphs specific to a particular question or domain is better than trying to capture all knowledge in a graph because they can quickly become over complex and hard to manage. Um, so what we do, we start with a, the kind of question we have in mind and we'll design a graph um, such as the drug repurposing one. Um, and the aim is to yes, yeah, support hypothesis generation for specific uh, scientific questions. So yeah, that's all from me. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, thank you, Michael. That was really interesting, actually, um, specifically on knowing who's working on what in an organization. That's quite, uh, I can really relate to that. I think we can yeah, really sure. <laughs> use that expertise. Um, okay, so we are gonna now go on to our last and final presentation. We now have Joel Sachs, bioinformatics programmer for agriculture and agri-food from Canada. Um, he's going to talk to us um, in more specific detail on this topic and in relation to agriculture. So our piece of the biodiversity knowledge graph. Over to you, Joel. All right. Thanks, Iman. All right. So uh, I'll give a little overview of uh, what I'll talk about. I'll start with a famous slide uh, from Rod Page that uh, some of you may have seen. Uh, that lays out a vision to a, uh, a global biodiversity, distributed biodiversity knowledge graph. I'll talk a little bit about a component of that graph that we're building here, namely the Integrated for Canada. So we're sort of looking at three different um, potential software platforms for this, Semantic Media Wiki, uh, Wikidata, and Wikibase, and Metafactory. So I will share a little bit about lessons learned uh, as we looked at each of those because it sort of illustrates our priorities and, um, and concerns, but really it's not so important what platform we're using to, to share the data. What's important is the, the role that uh, what we produce plays in the sort of ecology of uh, data and services that we're trying to build with, uh, with, with other collaborators. And then the what, I, what I'm building towards is to, to, to engage um, the audience a, in a discussion of what are the components that we need uh, if we want a, a biodiversity knowledge graph that supports uh, agriculture. So here is uh, Rod's, uh, Rod's picture from a blog post in, I think, 2014 or 15. He uh, then wrote a real paper uh, based on that, on that blog post. And you see there are images, uh, specimen sequences, phylogenies, traits uh, that have linkages within them. Uh, so how to capture those linkages explicitly so that in the way that uh, both Kurt and Michael were showing, the, the graph can be traversed uh, in both an intuitive but also sometimes in a, in a serendipitous uh, manner, and also that, so that it can support integrative queries uh, across that data. Um, there are some, some nodes that are missing here. So, for example, here at Agriculture, we're doing a lot of work on metagenomics, information on uh, gene function or uh, um, uh, um, functional subsystems uh, is something that we're gathering to, to be a component of, uh, of our graph. We want an integrated flora of Canada. So, um, to get started, this is um, this goes back a little bit to some some recent work that we've done. So this is a, a digital representation of a treatment from the floor of North America. So you can see that there's uh, taxonomic and nomenclatural information at the top, uh, and then there is a, a terse morphological description. Then there's uh, phenological data, and then a discussion. So we have a colleague in Arizona. Um, Hong Shui, who collaborated us with us on a number of uh, previous NSF projects, and she's developed software to uh, parse taxonomic treatments and extract uh, this data in, in a fine-grained way. 
So if we look at the next slide, this is another digital representation, but this is has been constructed via uh, taking it apart and then putting it back together. So here you see the taxonomy, the, um, the morphological traits that have been parsed out um, that we've then loaded into Semantic Media Wiki, uh, um, Apex architecture, um, base architecture, etc. So having done this, uh, we can we can query for particular uh, uh, character states. Uh, in this case, ascending for the character apex orientation. Uh, this is cool. We can build a, uh, an interactive key uh, by constructing uh, a variety of filters. So here we're looking at filters for corolla coloration, stem orientation, stem external texture, and flowering time, um, and the various possibilities for each. As you start to um, make some uh, decisions, you say, well, the thing that I'm looking at right now is purple, and the stem orientation is erect, and you get a sort of differential diagnosis of what it, uh, what, uh, what you might be looking at, uh, and what other characters uh, you would still need to specify. Well, so here is the final uh, in that in that example, the final seven uh, possibilities. That is um, the work we did to to build this uh, queryable uh, version of. Um, the floor of North America, uh, and I'm happy to, to share more information on that with anybody interested. But what we really want to do is build an integrated floor of Canada, integrated in a couple of sentences. One, uh, in that uh, it will um, integrate with, it will combine with data from a variety of sources, specimen data, uh, sequence data, phylogenetic uh, data, uh, potentially uh, information on conservation status or invasive disconcern or crop wild relatives, other things that are concerned to agriculture. But it will also integrate from multiple potentially conflicting sources. So floor of North America is one input, but floor of Manitoba is another, regional floors are others. And sometimes they agree and sometimes they disagree on characters for particular. Some of the requirements for, for, for this project are that the treatment pages are editable. Provenance is important since uh, we, we will have conflicting uh, data for some treatments. We want this to be well and easily embedded in the in the semantic web, in particular in this uh, biodiversity knowledge graph. We don't want to do it all, so community support is important, uh, and we don't have an unlimited budget, so um, so cost effective uh, is important as well. So SMW was great for representing flora of North America. However, uh, there's provenance is very difficult to achieve. It doesn't really embed well into into the broader semantic web. Uh, there are extensions uh, that that make it uh, maybe more seamless, and we we worked with them and we developed one. But um, th there are a number of technical uh, challenges. And truthfully, it doesn't uh, scale well as we, uh, you know, as 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 we continue to add um, add data. So we were looking for for a couple of other options. So Wikidata, like SMW, is a project of the um, uh, Wikimedia Foundation, and it provides uh, a centralized repository to feed the info boxes across multilingual. Uh, Wikipedia articles. So whereas instead of having to um, edit uh, the French and the English and the Russian and the Chinese um, uh, info boxes for an article, you you edit it once and it feeds uh, feeds the other um, uh, all all of the the Wikipedias. It is fairly well integrated uh, within the semantic web via a tool called uh, the Wiki Data Query Service, uh, which was built on the Metafactory platform, which uh, I'm about to talk about a little bit. Uh, the software behind Wikidata is Wikibase. So we are looking both at how much of our data do we want on Wikidata, which is the, uh, the, the source that is sort of global in scope that feeds into Wikipedia, and uh, how much of the information that we have is perhaps beyond the scope of Wikidata, 
and is best managed in our own personal Wikidata, that is by, by running our own instance of Wikibase. To give an example of why we're thinking along these lines, everything in Wikidata is community curated. So if you have an idea for a new property, there's a discussion around uh, what properties are perhaps needed to model a domain, and, uh, and then there is consensus, and then the property is introduced into Wikidata. Uh, we have, it, with the Asteraceae alone, over 3,000 morphological properties. So we don't really see that as a candidate for that sort of uh, community uh, curation process. Uh, so the Wikidata uh, model uh, has provenance built in sort of as a, as a first-class citizen. There's a data model called the SNAP model. Um, and that, th this is what first attracted it, uh, us to it. What did we realize is that this stack model is great if you're only working within Wikidata, but once you're moving into the broader semantic web, you will want to use one of the uh, standard RDF mechanisms for managing provenance, and Wikidata doesn't map well, the Wikidata stack model doesn't map well into that. Well, mentions that um, the provenance is, is non-standard. Other than that, we like it a lot. If you go into the next slide, I start talking about how our preferred mechanism of provenance is named graphs. Uh, reification is another famous, but uh, notoriously uh, syntactically difficult uh, mechanism for, for, for provenance. Quads are very popular. We like name graphs where each data source is stored in its own name graph, uh, has an easy syntax, intuitive semantics, uh, vastly simplifies reification. Uh, well, and here is just a discussion that we can, once we, once we decide to use name graphs for provenance, we can also use it to manage um, all sorts of context that speaks to the trustworthy of the data, including the mechanism of inference that we're using. So we're experimenting with a lot of different approaches to inference, uh, and rather than add all of that to the, the graph, it makes sense to sequester the knowledge that's gained from each approach in its own uh, named graph. And even the inputs to that inference can be managed in their own named graph. Uh, well, this is a continuation of that, that, that idea. Ah, so an advertisement for named graphs, that should not be a question mark, that should be a, a, next, uh, a period. I mean, this is an advertisement for named graphs. Um, as some of you might have noticed, a lot of information on the web is useless or imprecise or insufficiently sourced or wrong. And the same is true on the semantic web. And so uh, we found name graphs to be helpful in addressing this. Um, and then I have a little bit of technical information, I guess, on, on uh, how the name graph idea uh, arises, uh, which, which maybe isn't that important for now. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about this other platform that we looked at. We, there are many platforms for representing graphs, uh, for building graphs, for navigating graphs. Um, uh, it looks like Kurt is developing a, a cool one that he was using uh, to demonstrate uh, his, uh, uh, his points in his, in his talk. Uh, we were attracted to Metafactory because it is, was used to build the Wikidata query service. And because we have so much invested in the um, MediaWiki uh, ecology already, integration with that ecology, whether it's SMW or Wikidata, is sort of important to us. Uh, well, these are just some, some screenshots. Again, they don't turn out well, but it, this is everything that you would expect. And we sort of saw this from both Michael and Kurt out of a knowledge graph platform, uh, templates for uh, building what for us would be treatment pages uh, so that the the, the treatment itself is uh, an on-the-fly Sparkle query or collection of Sparkle queries, user interface for exploring the graph visually, some uh, mechanisms for, for semantic search, for faceted search, uh, et cetera. This is, for example, to reproduce that sort of interactive key that uh, we were showing with, with SMW, and of course, a, a Sparkle interface. So we like Metafactory a lot. The treatment pages are editable. The provenance model is, or whatever we decide it to be, uh, for example, named graphs. Uh, I mean, it is essentially, it's using either Blaze Graph or Neptune, uh, which are two you know, true triple stores on the, on the back end. 
it's a little uh, pricey for us for a, a development license. Uh, it's about 23k a year, uh, which um, is certainly something we could budget for uh, once if we decide to um, uh, we decide to commit to it. Uh, but uh, we're still we're still exploring uh, uh, both manufacturing Wikidata and, and other potential uh, uh, platforms. Well, so these are just a couple of slides on uh, some fun stuff we do with the data. This is an exploration that a summer student did on uh, armature versus color treatments from floor of North America. I think this is building association fashion data mining on um, color and armature. Uh, well, so this is this is what I hope we can talk a little bit about. This slide is is a little old. Data comes in and out of our triple store. This is when we were experimenting with Allegro graph. Uh, so we would have to reconstruct if anybody's interested uh, in these particular uh, data sets. Um, uh, we might have to do some some forensic reconstruction of the RDF, but we can do that. This is really a, a, a discussion point. We're building a biodiversity graph for, um, you know, for biodiversity uh, informatics knowledge graph. Uh, what, um, what is crucial to support agriculture? Oh, well, so here are some ways that uh, you could collaborate. Uh, the first uh, link is to use cases from the forest of Ada in the floor of North America. Uh, the second are use cases that we built when we, uh, uh, for, for a hackathon that we held uh, about a year ago for uh, knowledge graphs in, in biodiversity, uh, and then uh, our data, well, we want it to, we want it to be used. Uh, if you have other ideas for how, uh, how uh, we might be able to help you or how you might be able to help us, uh, please don't be shy. Uh, so here at uh, the experimental farm at agriculture, these are key key members of the team, uh, which is led by James Macklin. David Kazam is a summer student that worked on those visualizations, and Jocelyn and uh, Beatrice uh, have been uh, our main developers. The Floor of North America Association uh, has given uh, sort of important guidance and, and feedback. Andrew Valance uh, is a, a wonderful European contractor. Uh, who specializes in semantic media wiki and did uh, a lot of work for us. And uh, now we're working with the, uh, with the Manifax team. And that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Joel. It was very informative. We're going to move over to now our questions and our answers and our comments. Kurt, um, you had shown your kind of live demo on a platform, and, and I think it is something that you developed. Yeah, um, the, the platform itself is called Gracie, which is the... Um, um, the the graph uh, curation integration um, and editing system um, it, it it essentially evolved out of a common requirement and I, I think that uh, uh, the, the previous discussion actually kind of pointed to it there are a number of tools out there right now a number of uh, knowledge graphs and knowledge bases um, or um, knowledge base, triple stores that are currently in development. You know, everything from Tiger Graph to Neo4j to MarkLogic to, you know, fill in the blank. Um, but there are relatively few decent uh, tools that are out there for doing knowledge graph management and, and really the visualization aspects of being able to build um, the um, ontologies and, and systems that, that often go into enterprises or into research facilities or things like that. And so one of the things that, that um, we're focused on, my, my group, um, the um, um, Semantic Data Group, SDG, um, is really kind of building out a set of tools that, that kind of work in the same basic domain as um, um, the, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting the name, the, 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 uh, the Metagraph or Meta, meta Tools that uh, uh, Joel was talking about earlier. We're uh, still in development. Um, expect to probably go in, we'll be working with uh, private clients, 
um, um, actually have started working with private clients. But our hope eventually is within the next um, six months to a year to essentially release a system um, that can be utilized by anyone as, as an open platform. Um, uh, essentially a, a, uh, uh, a managed system that can be used on top of other uh, data systems like Smart Log or Mark Logic or, or uh, Stardog or um, other systems like that. And so, um, you know, watch this space, I guess is the best way I'd say it right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. That's really useful. I'm going to go in and hand it over to Dario. If you have audio and you want to unmic yourself, I saw that you had a few questions. Um, no, I think um, there were mainly general questions on the auto, how the automatic is the production of these uh, knowledge graphs from the text, uh, how much uh, manual work is involved, and if there is a support for probability in the predicates they have seen. Thank you. Over. Yeah, um, I guess uh, I can take that one, Michael here. So, um, yeah, with the, um, the the text extraction for those knowledge graph building, um, we, we did that all automatically. Um, but what we do to kind of um, give strength to those relationships is on the graph itself, um, we have the edge which joins the two nodes. So you might have a, a target as a node, um, linked to a drug, which is another node, and between the two, you get an edge. And on that edge, we can add additional data, like um, how often was it seen in the text? Um, you can do statistics around how interesting it is. So um, this was a piece where we looked at dis disease similarity and the, or, or disease connections to particular genes. And sometimes you get a, a particular gene mentioned that's meant that's talked about in all sorts of contexts. So it's not particularly specific to anything that you, you kind of join it within your graph. Um, but you can do statistics to determine how specific is a particular gene to a particular um, disease mentioned. And you can, any, any of those kind of statistics that you calculate, you can put those onto the edge of your graph. And when it comes to querying the graph, you can filter based on different um, uh, values which you attach to the edge um, yeah so so yeah that's that, that's kind of that's it really thank you Michael did anybody have anything to add Joel or Kurt to that yeah uh, one of the things that you'll find is that there are a number of different mechanisms for basically ingesting content um, uh, some of them work better than others. It really depends upon the kind of information you're dealing with, how much structure it has, um, um, what tools you're using. Um, uh, the one thing that I, um, I'm hoping to be able to incorporate on, on what we're building, and I, I certainly you know, expect to see it elsewhere as well, is that um, uh, you can, with more and more of these systems, basically bind, um, actually load or upload um, file entries and things like that that might contain binary information that can be filtered and processed. You know, um, um, one area, for instance, you know, obviously e easy ones are things like Excel documents, where it becomes just a matter of saying, okay, here's a filter that you can write to be able to parse that. But um, I'm expecting to see with um, uh, over the course of the next year or so, uh, you're going to start seeing things like Jupyter notebooks um, being able to be processable. Anything that has data graphs in it uh, should be processable in a similar manner. And, you know, one of the things that you run into when dealing with any kind of knowledge graph is that oftentimes it's, as, as Michael mentioned, and I think it's a very important point, um, you're often at a stage, in it, or Joe, Joel may have mentioned, I, I, I'm sorry there, but uh, um, you're, you're often at a stage where with knowledge graph you're often making choices about what kind of information you actually want to be able to capture. You can capture things like a uh, data frame 
um, out of R or out of uh, Python uh, <clears throat> as um, semantic information. Um, you generate a lot of triples in that process. And so, you know, if you're wanting to do analysis of those triples, um, you know, you can do it. And it's, you know, in some cases, it's actually quite efficient to be able to do it. But you have to basically go in understanding that if you're going to use semantics for raw data processing, then it's probably something that you want to do in a different way than you would with a knowledge graph. Um, a knowledge graph typically is something that you use primarily as a mechanism for organization, whereas data hubs or similar uh, more data-centric graphs are often essentially used as ways of encoding that information so that it may be available for, for different systems and different uses. So, you know, that's that's kind of been my experience anyway, I don't know, um, but I suspect it's probably a fairly common situation. Great, thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm gonna hand over some questions over to Elizabeth. Okay, yeah. So I, I just have a, a question. Uh, so I understand that a graph can be built automatically, but I was wondering still if your science domain you're targeting with your knowledge graph is evolving with a new uh, trends or a new um, area of research. Uh, how do you deal with that? How, you do, how do you update or, or expand your knowledge graph? For example, in agriculture, we've been now we are trying to connect a food uh, production system with a food system. So it's a new area for us to touch base on foods, nutrition, human health. So how would you, how a knowledge graph could help with that? Thank you, Elizabeth. Who wants to tackle that one? I can take. A I, I guess I could. Oh, oh yeah, go, go ahead, Michael. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I suppose the first thing is that um, automated scanning of um, text to add new information to the knowledge graph. So you might be scanning, constantly scanning new stuff coming out of PubMed or patents or, or news feeds and using algorithms to add, add kind of new relationships picked out of those into your graph. Um, where there's a challenge, it might be a brand new area of science. So someone's talking about maybe a gene or a drug that's no one no one's mentioned before. So using the pure ontology approach for extracting those entities is challenging. Um, but what yes. we're doing, I suppose this, this goes back to your, um, maybe when you did your machine learning one uh, the other week, you can actually train the computer on text to recognize these, this string of characters looks like it might be a drug based on the context that it's mentioned in. And what we can do is, try and keep our ontologies up to date by scanning this stuff, suggesting things that might be a new drug or gene or whatever, and then it goes to the curators to manually decide should this go into the ontology or not. So there is there is always, a, I think at the moment there's always needs to be a bit of a human filter to put new stuff into the ontology to enable that automated uh, graph building. But that could all change in the future. Okay. When, when you... Uh... Oh, go ahead, yeah. uh, we, we do something similar, uh, or rather the, the uh, parsing tool developed by, uh, by Han does something similar where it's, uh, it's parsing a treatment, it goes through a learning process, and in terms that it doesn't recognize, it uh, tries to categorize based on, uh, based on what it knows and based on the text. So maybe it hasn't seen the term glamorous before, but based on usage, it uh, says oh, here is a, um, um, a, a, a texture. Uh, and then the user has a chance to review the categorization of those uh, new terms uh, and can correct uh, if correction is necessary before a final uh, parsing step is, uh, is, is conducted. When, when you're looking at machine learning, um, <clears throat> the uh, machine learning is actually great at basically identifying when you have those situations and um, content um, that falls outside of what is known. Um, one of the things that I find is that as um, uh, as Joel put it, and I, I you know find the same thing uh, recently working. 
um, I had a conversation with the um, uh, the ontology lead over at Amazon um, developing their cataloging system. And you, know, you can imagine, you know, you're talking about you know, uh, literally tens of millions of different products coming into their system every single day. Um, so they have, they realized very quickly that, you know, there's a two-step process that has to be done. The first is basically using machine learning to try to figure out as much as possible um, what kind of categorization is feasible. But there's a second stage which also comes out, <clears throat> which is, is still a manual curation phase, that you have to go in at some point and say, yes, the machine is right or the machine is wrong, because oftentimes, mm -hmm. just because you've got a processing system like a, a, um, a machine learning system, you don't necessarily know that it's actually building something that is in, uh, in consonance with the, um, uh, the ontology that you're trying to create. And so even when you have that kind of information, you do generally need to have someone going back in and reviewing and saying, okay, this looks like it, uh, <clears throat> this looks like it needs to be adjusted to be able to, to do those factors. You know, if, if I've got a product that contains, you know, certain types of toothpaste, um, you know, what information I want to be able to pull out of is really something that then comes back down to, um, you know, someone essentially twiddling with that model to be able to, to make it work better. So it's still, you know, it's not automatic. We're still a long ways from it being at a point where you can just point it to a, a, a data set and say, you know, suck in all the data and you're, you've got a magical taxonomy that works. You know, I, I think we're probably still a good you know, five to ten years out from from anything that's that's quite that comprehensive. But you can get pretty good, and if if you've got you know reasonably regular, reasonably standardized or formalized content. Great, thank you, thank you, all three of you. Is that a good yeah, answer? Good question. Yeah. Um, what, I'm going to hand it over to Milko. If you can please unmute yourself, and then I'll find out. Yeah. Milko, are you still on the line with us? Yep, I'm there. I'm okay. there. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. And we see yep. you. Okay. See <laughs> no, I, I, my question was was actually very very similar or close to the one <clears throat> of Dario in the sense that you know, as he was saying, you support probability and predicates. That's that's quantitative data in a sense. So what I will do maybe is is sort of change it a bit. I mean, what kind of support do the tools you use, the databases you use, have in terms of using uh, quantitative data to select certain r routes, certain paths in your graphs? <clears throat> the the idea of incorporating, if I can jump in on this, the idea of incorporating machine learning and specifically um, a lot of the data science domain tools um, is something that really only has comparatively recently gotten into the tool sets themselves. Um, you know, part of it is basically, uh, basically comes down to what is the best way of being able to articulate the parameterizations, the, you know, the necessary pieces to be able to make these kinds of analyses. Um, you know, there has to be a kind of a, a core level ontology that allows you consistently to specify that kind of information. Um, and as a consequence, um, um, as you're seeing more tools in place, as you're beginning to see kind of the standardization around certain ontologies as being, you know, effectively more canonical than others, um, <clears throat> what ends up happening is that um, the vendors that are working with these particular systems are also essentially building out more specific tools, uh, either to add functionality into the, um, particularly in the Sparkle or, or similar range in the query range, or to be able to incorporate graphs um, and, and um, um, <clears throat> incorporate in the the graphs themselves um, 
um, kind of the edge node or the edge attributes. Part of this as well basically comes down to the fact that a lot of what you're dealing with, especially when you start talking about analysis of annotative data, is essentially um, what's often referred to as reification where you're basically saying not just, okay, I can make an assertion, but what is the strength of that assertion that we're talking about? And reification really really has only um, become you know, truly feasible in terms of, of efficiency, in terms of, of the, the kind of systems that you're talking about uh, currently, just within the last few years. I mean, the concept's been around for a long time, but um, uh, the, as I think was pointed out much earlier, reification is a very expensive process because it's essentially saying we have metadata that is specifically about the assertions that you're making in those systems, which means that you can often, you know, significantly increase your, your overload um, of the amount of triples that you're storing to be able to capture this kind of information. Uh, I think that's one area where property graphs have a certain degree of advantage. You can you can essentially model um, the same kind of information you have in property graphs and RDF graphs. Um, it's just really kind of comes down to what's the best mechanism for uh, working with that reification of content. And, and, you know, that's something I think we're going to see more and more of over time. Did Michael or Joel have anything additional to comment on that? Well, I think it was mentioned earlier that um, uh, not all data is appropriate for a knowledge graph, and, and I would say that a uh, collection of, um, of raw triples, uh, in theory, it can capture, I guess, any data structure, but it's not always the best choice. Um, so, for example, we have all of these association rules coming out of our data mining runs, um, and we, we could, I suppose, represent them as N3 rules, uh, which is a um, um, you know le legitimate uh, RDF mechanism for representing rules, and then reify them by adding the support and the confidence and the lift and those other um, you know metadata components uh, of a data mining uh, result. But we don't uh, see the utility in, in doing that since the data mining results are typically going to be explored via some sort of purpose-built visualization, not by some general purpose triple reader that uh, and, 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 and graph visualizer. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, thanks. We're going to take it over, if that's okay, uh, if that answered your question, Milko, we're going to take the last question from Elizabeth and we're going to wrap up. Yeah, I just wanted to come back a little bit on uh, Joel's indication that uh, they, they are working on a knowledge graph for various topics uh, among which invasiveness of species, conservation, cooperatives. And of course, this brings uh, back to, to our community because we uh, work on uh, wild species relative to crops, of course. And then I would like just, Joel, to, to indicate if our community is interested to contribute to that. Uh, with data, ontologies, or whatever. Yeah, what, what, what would be the contribution we could make? Joel, I think that's specific for you. Well, we, we, should, we, should, uh, we should talk, I guess. Um, I mean, we, uh, we were doing this as a proof of concept. We, uh, we, we tracked down a, a, a paper that uh, seemed to be um, uh, the basis for uh, a lot of uh, uh, crop wild relative um, uh, work, and we sort of encoded that data. We created some, 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 uh, I guess, uh, uh, um, ontological artifacts uh, to 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 represent the space of crop wild relatives, and then we. Uh, we added that to our treatment so that if you're looking at a treatment for something in, uh, that was a, a crop, you could look at the um, at the wild relatives uh, and explore the wild relatives. So, uh, um, you know, if if 
there are other data sources that we should be including um, and other sort of integrative queries that we should be posing, uh, then, then we can talk about that and, uh, and, and try to uh, maybe first build a proof of concept uh, to see if we're on the same page and then, and then work out from there. Great. Will be a, a follow up discussion then, and probably uh, involving the global biodiversity informatics facility colleagues into that too. Great. Um, I'm going to have to wrap us up because we're right at time at the moment. Um, so thank you again to the three presenters um, and thank you for taking the questions and the comments. I think we could even keep going, but I'm conscious that we're at time and. Um, we tried to stick as much as possible to time, but, and as you can see, Elizabeth and Joel and, and, and Kurt, I mean, I mean, Michael as well, there's a lot of kind of interesting things happening and collaborations that are spinning off of these webinars. And I think um, that's kind of a, a byproduct of, of this year's webinar. So um, again, thank you. And really it's just um, a jump off point for some really interesting and, and greater things. Um, I'm just gonna hand it over to Elizabeth to kind of wrap us up and close us up for our last, uh, webinar and just in case you need to be in touch with Elizabeth um, her contact information is right here um, and as mentioned she's leading the ontology's community practice she's a scientist here at Biodiversity International if you want to wrap us up Elizabeth yeah so I want to, to thank our three speakers because really they have prepared this webinar with a very uh, great presentation also particularly Kurt because I know it was super early for you from Seattle mm -hmm. and Joel too so we appreciate and I could see we have colleagues from Philippines connected. So it was a great uh, time slot anyway. Um, thank you very much. And if you have any further questions, then just send them to me um, and I can, I can reply or I can guide you to our speakers as well. So thanks everyone. And thanks to Aman and Céline, I must say. Without them, uh, the webinars couldn't be as, uh, as great as they are. So Céline is the communication coordinator of the community of practice and Aman has been our uh, uh, dynamic facilitator for all the webinars this year. Thank you.